Ladies, we made it. We made it through the book of Job. What an experience it's been. We are at lesson six. Uh, God responds to Job, and wow, what a journey it's been. And I wonder if you guys have ever had this experience where you and a girlfriend are, were set to meet for lunch, and you call them up and you say, hey, where do you want to go? And instead of a list of possibilities, well, we could go to Taco Bell, we could go to, they, they respond with the dreaded answer, I don't know, where do you want to go? Don't you just hate that? Don't you hate when people answer your question with a question, right? Well, Job had a lot of questions, right? He had a lot of questions. And over the last 35 chapters, God has been absent from the account. We haven't heard anything. We read nothing of his direct role in comforting or speaking to or sustaining Job in the midst of this crisis. All of this time, Job has ached repeatedly for a word from God. Because Job wanted God to prove him right. He wanted him to explain the reasons for his suffering. And Job's friends wanted God to prove them right and to show Job his error, right? But God isn't going to meet totally either of these expectations. He did not answer Job's specific questions, but instead responded with some questions of his own. And as it would be, we were visiting this weekend with um, a good, good friend of our family, a wonderful psychiatrist in Ventura, Dr. Tim Tice, and he said something that was so profound. I said, I have to quote you, because he was talking about as a psychotherapist, it's much more important to ask appropriate questions to help a person recognize on their own the reality of a situation in a way that hasn't occurred to them. Just giving them the information doesn't help them change. But when it's a realization on their own that helps them to see their trauma in a new light and move past it. When it occurs to them, it's much more likely to change them than if the therapist, the counselor, just gives them the information. Isn't that interesting? And I just thought, you know, our everlasting, wonderful counselor seems to take the same approach. And our central idea today is that God helps Job discover answers that satisfy his soul. And us, too, I should say. We get to discover it along with him. So we're going to talk about our section of scripture in three parts God's Nature Review, chapters 38 and 39, Two Powerful Beasts, and then Job's Confession and Restoration in chapter 42. We have seen so much raw agony in our friend Job. Have you guys felt it? Have you felt it? Have you been studying? Have you been weighed down with this agony? Yeah. He had many questions and complaints. And in a sudden turn of events, God responds to Job out of the whirlwind. So I want to start reading a little bit in the message paraphrase of Scripture. Job 38.1, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. And perhaps God speaks directly to Job because Job was the only one of the group that was actually talking to him. Job talked to God, and now the Lord is going to speak directly to him out of this great whirlwind. And this whirlwind seems to refer to the storm that Elihu was, was talking about was approaching in chapter 37. And there's several other significant whirlwinds in the Bible. You know, some of them were that God brought Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind. God's presence is in the whirlwind in Psalm 77. God's coming is like a whirlwind in Isaiah 66 and Jeremiah. And then God appeared to Ezekiel in a whirlwind as well. And God says that Job questioned his wisdom and he spoke without knowledge. Now, 
it wasn't that God expected Job to know everything, the things that he couldn't know, but he wanted and expected them to appreciate that there were aspects to the world that were known only to God. So he responds to Job's accusations that he's been unjust and incompetent at running the universe. Verses 4 to 7, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations? And who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? It's like God speaks with joy about his creation. You get that sense. And the questions that God had for Job, of course, were unanswerable. And they were just meant to show Job that he really had no place to demand answers from God. And God's purposes here, they weren't just to correct and rebuke. Maybe the greatest truth is just that God has now appeared to Job, right? Just sit in that a moment when we think of the last couple of chapters that we've been through with Job. Now God was talking to him. His greatest agony had been that he felt abandoned by God. And now here was God. What massive comfort Job must have felt in simply being once again consciously in the presence of God. And you know, as I went through this lesson, I kept thinking, well, there's kind of an answer that Job got. There's an answer. So I just started a list. And it is not exhaustive. It is not com it, whatever comprehensive. And I hope you guys can add to it. But I'm just going to start a list. Answers Job discovered. Number one, God is with him. But God had some teaching to do. So he said, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And the intention of this question is obvious. Job was nowhere, right? Job was not there, right? God's ancient power and wisdom are more than he could ever consider. He could not think for a minute that he was on the same level as God. God has his eyes on all these cosmic details that Job can't even imagine. Astrophysicists estimate there's one billion galaxies. I don't know if I read that right. One billion galaxies. And each galaxy could have up to a trillion stars. So God says, I'm basically directing the trajectory of trillions of stars. Chapter 38 goes on to tell the wonders of creation of earth and sea, days and time, light and darkness, clouds, rain, snow. It's a divine speech focusing on the wonders of creation. And we talked about this in one of the groups. I don't know that, that God's tone was necessarily angry and harsh with Job. It's entirely possible that God's manner with Job was, was warm and loving more than a rebuke. I found this one quote by David Atkinson. It says, it may rather be there's a general irony to the tone and the questions are not asked threatening, but rather educative. The sort of questions a good teacher may ask a child in order to elicit understanding. It's as though the Lord God is taking Job on a walk through his creation and is inviting Job to accompany him. Do you see this? Do you recognize that? Sort of as Jesus, we looked at this verse later, invited his disciples, consider the lilies. So here, God is inviting Job to consider the beauty and the order and the wonder of the creative world. These questions remind Job there were many things he did not know. Chapter 39 goes into animals, a zoological tour of goats and donkeys and ostrich and horse and hawk and eagle. And we can't understand or control these amazing animals. So how could Job expect to control the mysterious events of life? Only God can control the created world. Another answer Job discovered, God is in control. The world is full of mystery, strange, unapproachable, overpowering mysteries that we can't read. And God's essentially saying trust in the power, in the wisdom, in the goodness of him 
the Almighty One who rules it. Mason says, if we find it exasperating that God never gives Job any reasons for his long ordeal of suffering, then we've missed the point of these final chapters. While it is true that the Lord's answer to Job is neither logical nor theological, this is not the same as saying that he gives no answer. The Lord does give an answer. His answer is himself. Isn't that good? God's answer to Job's suffering, questioning soul is himself, the great I am. The world I created is more intricate than your human mind can imagine. And in this way, God is helping Job discover these answers that will satisfy his soul. And we see that they do because they bring about a change in Job's soul. We see it as he speaks at the start of chapter 40. Before describing the last two beasts of God's creation, we have the first of two responses that we get in this section of scripture. Job 40, then the Lord said to Job, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? Then Job replied to the Lord, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I'll cover my mouth with my hand. I've said too much already. I have nothing, nothing more to say. This different tone of Job's answer wasn't because his circumstances had changed. You see, at this point, nothing had changed. He was still in misery and still had lost everything. But it changed because while he once thought that God had forsaken him, now he knew that God was with him. And Job says, I'm nothing. Literally, it means I have no weight. I'm nothing. Here in the presence of the majesty of God, he confesses his insignificance by comparison. He realizes the time for speaking is over and it's the time to listen. We looked at Ecclesiastes 5 too, which is the book of wisdom right before this book of Job. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. What a great word for us. When we're confused and hurting, we need to take time to learn from Job and just press in and listen to him. I believe it's God invites our questions. He invites us to be pressing in, but we need to take that time to just put our hand, if we have to, put your hand over your mouth. You know, I have this old rickety anti-gravity chair. I think it was one of the first ever made in my backyard, but I love that thing. And I've kind of set it aside as a place that I just go and I pop it back so I feel like I'm floating. And I just look at the sky and the trees and I try to listen. Just listen. Just stop. You know, there's time for Bible study. There's time for reading. But then there's time for listen. And like I have said, I have to set a timer because I'm bad with that. I have an app that has bells that will track your time when you're meditating and praying. Just listen to what God has to say. Maybe I'll bring a word of scripture, a new, fresh awareness of his presence. Verse 6, then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. It's like God saying, okay, get some new strength. Prepare yourself for a second encounter. I'm not done yet. Verse 6, will, 8, I'm sorry, will you discredit my justice and condemn me just to prove you're right? Ouch. You see, Job had fallen into the trap of thinking that because he couldn't figure God out, that perhaps God wasn't fair. In this section of God's revelation, he shows there are just many things that Job doesn't know. Job has questioned if God's handling of the world is just. But even that question shows a deeper assumption that he has enough perspective to make that claim. You get that? Job doesn't have a big enough worldview to even question whether God is just or not. So God shows him even more. 
He gives him a look at these two remarkable creatures. I found, oh, the, the, the images online are fabulous. Bamf, described as the fiercest land animal. And the precise identity of this is debated. Most think God had in mind a hippopotamus, one of the largest, strongest, dangerous. Then in chapter 41, we meet Leviathan. And I love that he's so, so cool. He doesn't even need a, an, what's a the, an adjective, a article, the. It's not the Leviathan. It's just Leviathan, right? He doesn't even need an article. We meet Leviathan, the fiercest sea animal, you know, perhaps a giant crocodile or a whale. Earlier in Job 3, Job said how sailors and fishermen would curse threatening Leviathan with the same passion that he cursed the day of his birth. And so there's lots written about this. It'd be fun if you guys want to look at it. Are they real or mythical? Some believe this passage describes some ancient dragon-like dinosaurs that either survived to Job's day or were in the collective memory of the people. But we know that they're symbols of disorder and danger. And they're symbols that God's world is amazing, but not always safe. Sometimes it's quite dangerous. And Job was called to recognize his own impotence in the face of omnipotence. And these massive creatures, we had to remember the omnipotent power of God. He is the only one that can control these terrifying beasts. So we have another answer Job discovered. discovered. His, Job's worldview is not big enough to judge God's ways. So in review, Job charged God is unjust. God responded, you're not in a position to make that claim. Job demands an explanation for his suffering. And God responds by asking him to trust in his wisdom and character we live in a complex world that is not designed to prevent suffering. That's not how the world is designed. And God ends his words to Job without ever telling him the story. He was left ignorant about that contest at the start between God and Satan that prompted all of this crisis. Although perhaps later, if Job is the author of this book, later God did reveal it to him. But though at this point Job didn't know the whole story, God told him of his creation and control over all these created things. And in the process, God helped Job discover the answers that satisfy his soul. So we come to Job's confession and his restoration. Chapter 42, then Job replied, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. With confidence, Job states that the God who can master Behemoth and Leviathan can also accomplish every purpose in Job's life, including the mysterious meaning, meaning behind his suffering. Another answer Job discovered, number four, God is powerful. He knew it. He experienced it. He saw it. Verse three says, Job's talking, you asked, who is it that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. And you know, Job said, after chapter 2, when he had that wonderful expression of worship, after that he said many sad and imprudent things. Both in his agonized cry in chapter 3, his bitter, contentious debate with his friends, he doubted the goodness of God, he doubted if there was any good in this life or the life beyond, and now he's come full circle, back to this state of humble contentment with not knowing the answers to the questions raised by his crisis and by his companions. It reminded me so much of Psalm 131. I had to memorize it a while back. It says, Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with things too great or too awesome for me to grasp. Instead, I've calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, 
Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Oh, Israel, put your hope in the Lord now and always. You know, ever, anybody that's ever breastfed a baby or been, a, been around a baby, you know, there's always that cry, that, that cry, you know, okay, he's how he wants something, wants something, wants something, they want to eat, they want to eat, they want to eat. And then that season's over, and there's a contentment there. The child doesn't, isn't, you know, looking, 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 asking, you're just content. And that's the picture we have in Scripture. You know, the other answer I think Job discovered, number five, was that I, I can't comprehend the ways of God. And I can be okay with not knowing. You know, it's okay. That's a, that's a tough one for me. It's okay with not knowing everything. I like to know everybody. I like to be in everybody's business. It's okay to not know everything. So Job repents. He repents. Verse 4, talking to God, you said, Listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. This phrase, he says, I had heard about you, but now I've seen you. And I just thought, oh, golly, let's not settle for just hearing about God, you know? Like getting more info, going to another women's Bible study, learning more knowledge in our heads. We need to see God. You know, my sister recently told my mom that every day we should go on an awe walk, A-W-E, an awe walk, where you ask God, I'm going to go for a walk, even in my neighborhood, and, and look for something that's going to draw me into the awe of God. And he does it. He does it. In, in your neighborhood, in a busy street, when we ask God, show me who you are, show me your glory, we see him. We see him answering our prayers. I don't know if you guys, if you're jaded about praying about little things, God loves to answer those little prayers that we have, doesn't he? The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 63. He says, you, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. For I have seen you in your sanctuary. I've beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. The psalmist took that time to push into the sanctuary of God. And the sanctuary of God is wherever his presence is. The sanctuary of God can be your kitchen pantry, if that's where you have to go to be alone with him and see him and know him. I just pray that for us, that we'll be seeing God. Another answer Job discovered, number six, seeing God is enough. The most powerful aspect of Job's encounter with God wasn't just what God said, but God's simple, loving, powerful presence that changed him. But it was right for Job to repent, right? He had, he had really said a mouthful. He'd done nothing to invite the crisis that came into his life, but he did have to repent of his wrong words after the crisis. Though God clears Job of all charges, Notice that God's declaration is after he repents. Before this moment, God calls Job a fault finder who speaks without knowledge and he puts God in the wrong. Spurgeon listed several things that Job needed to repent of. He needed to repent of the terrible curse he pronounced on the day of his birth, of his desire to die, of his complaints against and challenges to God of his despair, that his statements had been a darkening of wisdom by words without knowledge, that he'd spoke beyond his knowledge and ability to know. We see that Job learned, number seven, humble trust and repentance is always our right response to God when we see him. Job learned it, and he despised himself he repented. King James, 
I abhor myself in dust and ashes. He saw who he really was in the face of that holy God. So we come to the prologue, the end of the book. 42.7, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. So take seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer on your behalf. I will not treat you as, your, as you deserve, for you've not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. God rebuked Job's three friends, but curiously, where's Elihu? Where's Elihu? Where is he? And it's fun again to read some of the theories. Is it because Elihu was correct in what he said and was indeed God's messenger? Maybe. Another scholar said, taking into account exactly the mean spirit of what Elihu said, it might be more correct that God did not answer him as a way of dismissing him altogether. Not even going there. We don't know. But God's rebuke of the three friends was at the same time a vindication of Job. It was true that in his frustration and misery, Job had said things that he had to repent of. Yet God could still say, my servant Job has spoken rightly about me. Maybe just in that last confession that he made. But we see God honors Job's struggle. God honors his honesty. And God honors Job's prayer. Prayer was the right way to process the suffering that he was going through. And now Job becomes the means of bringing these friends back into right relationship with God. He, he is sent, maybe as part of his healing, to be a mediator, an intercessor on their behalf. And the Lord restored his fortunes exactly doubled what he had before. The brothers and sisters came to comfort and brought gifts. Where had they been? Did anybody think, wait a minute, there's brothers and sisters? Come on. Well, they came now. They came out of the woodwork better late than ever. You know, and in the beginning of the story, Job was blessed and godly, and at the end, he's more blessed and more godly. Verse 13, he had also seven sons and three daughters. He called the name of the first daughter Jemima, the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapuch. And in all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughter. Lisa Harper loves this passage. Not only are these three daughters mentioned, but they're given names. And she says they're described almost in Cinderella terms, the fairest of them all. And their names are fascinating. I'm going to talk really fast because it's so funny. Jemima, turtle dove or daybright. Keziah, cinnamon or cassia, fragrant, scents. Karen Hapuch is a jar of eye paint, which means the idea she was so beautiful, she didn't need makeup. Come on, <laughs> come on. Now that's beautiful. And Job gives his, his gorgeous daughters an inheritance with their brothers. And even mentioning women in this time is pretty special. And this unlikely favor of Job's daughters, I just think it's a, it's a tender expression to us today. The ultimate reason for Job's suffering was never known. And, and just as we know suffering wasn't a punishment for wrongdoing, so his restoration isn't necessarily a reward. Oh, he passed the test. Not necessarily. God, in his wisdom, decides to give Job this gift at the end of his life. Verse 16, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons four generations. Job died, an old man, full of days. Drop the mic. We did it. <laughs> well, this book of Job, it doesn't unlock why bad things happen to good people, but it invites us to trust. And it invites us not to just try to figure out reasons. I think when we're struggling and we try to search for reasons, we can tend to simplify God. And we can say things that aren't right. We can accuse God based on our limited evidence. 
the, the central idea from one of our first lessons was that Job invites us honestly to bring our pain to God and trust that he is working in unseen realities. God helps Job and us discover answers that satisfy his soul. I heard a message just this past weekend by a great speaker, John Mark Comer, and he talked about three stages of growing faith. And it's fascinating because we see them all in the study of Job. The first faith he describes as a faith of religion. You know, this is de definitely what Job and his three friends start out with. It's a set of beliefs that explain what life is about, how we get here. It's based on if I do this, God will do that. It's a very formulaic approach where we use biblical principles kind of as, as set hard and fast rules. But what does it mean when everything turns sideways, when a crisis comes? Then we can move into the faith of desperation. And this faith is when all of our fears come true, we still cry out to him for mercy. And boy, we saw that with Job. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives, right? He says, he knows the way that I take, and when he's testing me, I'm going to come forth as gold. It's an active faith, even in suffering, because we know that when we see God and cry out for his mercy, he's going to answer us. We're going to see his power. But then we come to the highest level of faith, the faith of surrender. And this is the faith we saw in Jesus on the night before he was crucified when he said, not my will, but yours be done. And this was the final heart posture we see in Job when he said, my eyes have seen and I repent in silence. The faith of surrender says that I want and choose what better leads to God's deepening life in me. This is the goal of our faith, that we could hold all of the reality of life, all of the hard, the highs, the lows, the good, the bad, and be grateful, content, and at peace. Not that everything is going to work out, but even if my worst fears come true, we can still know these truths. And this is our challenge for today, that we can rest in this small list of, of just my ideas of the truths that Job discovered, and I hope you'll add to them. We can rest in the fact God's with me. God's in control. My worldview is not big enough to judge God's ways. God is powerful. I can't comprehend the ways of God. Seeing God is enough and humble trust and repentance is always gonna be the right response. So here at the end of our book, we rest in the faith of surrender. I hope, I hope you guys are there. I never want to speak about the suffering that I know each one of you here and people watching online, the suffering, the real suffering that you're experiencing, but this, these answers are a lifeline. These answers are an anchor for the soul. Don't let people tell you Job doesn't have answers, okay? Let's stop that. He answers us. He answers us, and we can rest in that faith of surrender, that God is working in unseen realities. So Spurgeon ends us with this quote, We are not all like Job, but we all have Job's God. Same God. Though we have neither risen to Job's wealth, nor will probably ever seek to Job's poverty, yet there is the same God above us if we be high, and the same God with his everlasting arms beneath us if we be brought low. Let's pray. God, we, we come with the words of Ecclesiastes that you are God in heaven and we are here on earth. We want our words to be few because we're dazzled by who you are today. We're dazzled by your control over the creatures in the heavens and um, that we're just a speck on a rock hurling through the universe and you manage all the details of our world and our life. 
Lord, I pray for each person here that our spirits will be encouraged today, that we will have new hope to face just another hour of suffering, another day, God, knowing that you are strong, that you are in control, and you love us. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the ultimate picture of that surrender, that you surrendered to the unjust suffering of the cross. You surrendered to it, and you willingly gave your life because the purposes of God were that every one of us could be redeemed by accepting that gift of salvation, the blood that you shed, Lord. And we celebrate that redemption today. We don't grieve as those who have no hope. We have hope. And we thank you for that. I, I just pray for each person here, Lord, that we will know your hope, your peace, your joy in new ways through our study of Job. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.